This video addresses the question of whether Satan's evil angels are immortal, and thus, cannot die. Let us begin with a two-part question. Are Satan's fallen angels immortal, and is Satan in charge of hell? Generally, Satan is almost always pictured as being in control of hell where he tends the fires, burning its agonizing inhabitants. Satan is usually depicted as overseer of the tormenting of the wicked people residing there. However, with that said, is that truly what is going to eventually happen, and is it happening right now? It appears that arrangement would seem to make God and Satan partners. Is that possible? If true, God would then have to designate Satan as the one in charge of the punishment of the wicked. That scenario raises serious doubts based on what Bible scriptures say about God and his relationship with Satan. Furthermore, and most importantly, would God be agreeable to that kind of an arrangement? Another question that must be asked. Is Satan providing a service for God by punishing the wicked, or are they true enemies as the Bible says? The answer to that question can easily be answered by reading what the Bible says, as it clearly reveals what type of relationship God has with Satan. The prophet Isaiah says this in Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. Isaiah wrote that Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to have the power and respect that God had. So, he became proud and aggressive in his actions. The prophet Ezekiel provides more information about what happened to Satan, who originally was the anointed covering cherub. Ezekiel wrote in chapter 28, verses 14 through 16. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, you covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. As recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28, God originally created Satan as being perfect in all his ways. But, because of his becoming proud, and wanting to be like God, he became full of violence. He became a profane thing, and so God had to cast him out of the mountain of God. In addition, other scriptures that tells us that God is going to destroy him. Jude, and 2 Peter, tell us that Satan, and his evil angels, could no longer stay in heaven. God cast them down to the earth, so they had to leave heaven, their first estate. Jude, chapter 1, verse 6. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, held for judgment. 
Satan took his fallen angels and came to the earth to deceive Adam and Eve. Because of that, today, the whole world is attacked and deceived by them. The book of Revelation records that Satan was able to get back into heaven once again after he was initially thrown out. But in the end of days, Satan will be thrown out of heaven once again, permanently, for the last time. Revelation, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9 tells us that Satan was kicked out of heaven, along with his evil angels. However, what is recorded in the Revelation chapter 12, 10 through 12 passage appears almost like it is the same description as when Satan was kicked out the first time. But there is a noticeable difference in the two passages. Revelation, chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation, and the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God, day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, you, heavens and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. This time around Satan is cast down from heaven after he has accused God's people before, our God, day and night. He was cast out from heaven the second time, after accusing the saints before God. The scriptures do not say what he was accusing them of though. Satan is now portrayed as being enraged, because he knows that he only has a short time left before his permanent end comes about. Undoubtedly, he knows that he is nearing the end, and his very existence is drawing to a close. Because of the realization of his ending, Satan is now even more like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour with the time he has left. So, the coming end of Satan's time will be especially hard for God's people because of his rage against them. 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The Bible makes it very clear, there can be no agreement of any kind between God and Satan. God is going to destroy Satan, and Satan knows it. They are enemies. Therefore, Satan cannot be in charge of Sheol because of any kind of agreement made between him and God. There are many people that say angels are immortal, and thus, cannot die. So, how could God possibly kill and destroy these evil angels if they cannot die, presumably because they are immortal? It's important to also note that many people are of the belief that these evil angels will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Which leads us to the question, is that true? According to the Bible, what is going to happen to these evil angels? At the end of times, these evil angels will be waiting for their judgment from God. However, it is important to the theme of this video, and, as a matter of record, of whether God's judgment results in death for them, or whether they are to be tormented by fire forever and ever. A passage of scripture in 1 Timothy provides the answer. According to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, God alone has immortality, and that means that no one else has immortality, especially Satan, and his evil angels. That passage reads, I direct you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without fault or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. If God alone has immortality, shouldn't that mean all others can die? Does it also mean angels too? Are they all going to die? Wow! So many questions and not enough answers. However, not so fast. We know that the angels in heaven will exist forever. However, it is on condition that they do not turn against God, or sin against him. The Bible does provide the exact answer to what will happen to Satan and the evil angels who followed him. 
Satan, and his evil angels, will die. The Bible also reveals to us what some of the evil angels had to say in conversations with Jesus. During some of those conversations, they felt terror at the realization that their end time is approaching. Luke, chapter 4, verse 34. Leave us alone. What business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It is very interesting that this particular demon asked Jesus if he was here to destroy them. It appears that their own eventual destruction is on their minds constantly. Matthew, chapter 8, verse 29. And they cried out, saying, What business do you have with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? It is obvious fallen angels have one great fear. They know that the time is coming when they will be destroyed, and they view Christ's presence as torment, reminding them of their coming end, before their time is nigh. The book of James speaks of this fear the demons have of their future. James, chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and shudder. The Bible does not teach that angels cannot die. Nowhere does it suggest that they cannot die. It succinctly tells us that only God is immortal. The Bible also says God will destroy the evil angels. Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. With this passage of scripture from Hebrews, a person can see one of the reasons why Jesus became flesh and blood was that, through his death, he would be able to destroy the devil. It is specifically through his death that Jesus has the power to destroy Satan. We see the exact same thing in the next snippet of scripture which tells us Christ was manifested on the earth so that he could destroy the works of the devil. 1 John, chapter 3, verse 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Satan, and his evil angels are destined to be placed in the same, everlasting lake of fire, that evil people will be placed in, and that fact is recorded in Matthew, chapter 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So, evil people, and evil angels, will be placed in the same everlasting fire. Evil, unsaved people, will experience their second death, which is permanent, since there is no coming back. Satan, and the evil angels, while they have not died before, will also be permanently destroyed. They will never exist again. Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation, chapter 20, verses 14 through 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The prophet Ezekiel uses specific language to describe how Satan will be destroyed. Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 14 through 19. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, you covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was haughty because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I threw you to the ground. I put you before kings, that they may see you. By the multitude of your wrongdoings, in the unrighteousness of your trade you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified and you will cease to be forever. Bible scriptures clearly state, God will destroy Satan by setting a fire from within him, that will devour him. And that fire will burn him until he is nothing more than ashes. Therefore, the evil angels will be destroyed in the same manner that Satan will be destroyed, by a fire that is set from within them, and turns them to ashes. The prophet Malachi confirms that fact. Malachi, chapter 4, 
verses 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of armies, so that it will leave them neither root nor branches. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and frolic like calves from the stall. And you will crush the wicked underfoot, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. This passage from Malachi says, all that do evil, not just evil humans, will be chaff. It is an emphatic statement that includes both people and the angels that have done evil against God. Jesus often speaks of us being branches, either attached, or grafted into the vine which is Jesus himself. In the domain of wickedness, Satan is the root, since he is the root of all evil. Evil originated with Satan. So, when God, through Malachi, says both root and branch are destroyed, it means that Satan, the root of all evil, will be destroyed along with all his followers, which are the branches. Evil people, and evil angels will both be destroyed, along with Satan, their leader. Within the same chapter of Revelation chapter 20, and only a few verses apart, the lake of fire is described as lasting forever and ever, even though it is also called the second death. So, how can it be both? The second death, as described in the Bible, means that there is no coming back, anywhere, anytime. Those that experience it will never be alive again. This is the same aspect, that of permanent death, that the wicked angels will also experience. And since the second death is well developed in Revelation, could there be something wrong with our understanding of the phrase, forever and ever, as used in God's word? Again, Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10 says the wicked, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, what does that phrase really mean? In Hebrew, the words, everlasting, forever, and, eternal, are used in the same context as the word, tall, is frequently used. Everlasting, forever, and, eternal, are almost always used to describe an unmeasured duration, just as, tall, is used to describe an unmeasured height. Their meaning can vary, depending on what, or who, is being described. For instance, tall, can be used to describe a tall mountain, or a tall man, yet they are not the same height. As a further example of the use of the phrase, forever and ever. Jonah says that the time he spent in the belly of the whale was, forever. However, in another verse, Jonah says he was in the whale for just three days. A major difference. Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord designated a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah, chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. So, I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The deep flowed around me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. I descended to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, Lord my God. Obviously, in Jonah's case, forever, meant three days and three nights. Another example from Old Testament Hebrew, where once again, forever, only means how long a person exists in this life. Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. If your fellow countryman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you for six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall give generously to him from your flock, your threshing floor, and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. And you are to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I am commanding this of you today. But it shall come about, if he says to you, I will not leave you, because he loves you in your household, since he is doing well with you, then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your servant forever. You shall also do the same to your female slave. Obviously, a person can only be a servant, or a slave, for as long as he or she lives. They do not live for eternity in this life. So, forever, in this context, means only his or her earthly lifetime. The idea that, forever, can be just a limited lifetime of an individual, is a common occurrence throughout the scriptures. Referencing back to Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10 once again we see, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, 
where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation, chapter 20, verses 14 through 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In conclusion, the phrase, forever, in the lake of fire, is a premise for however long it takes for the fire to fully consume those cast into it, and until all that remains of them are just ashes. This action clearly indicates that evil angels are not immortal and thus can die.